All right, we're at 15 after. Uh, wake everybody up here. Everyone's uh, probably had some lunch and probably a little sleepy at, right now. It's cold in here, though, so that might keep you awake. Uh, this is a short talk, and this was originally a 45-minute talk that I've made to go into 25 minutes, so we're going to try to go fast. I also cut out a lot of things that were in here before. So we're going to just go over some of the things that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, so hopefully you're in the right place. This is Understanding the Dark Side. A little louder? Really? OK. Is that better? No. Wow, I sound really loud up here to me. Is that better? Wow, OK. I'm going to have to be, they sound like I'm yelling. All right, so my name is Kristen. I work at Hook42, and I've been doing Drupal since 2004. So 13 years in April. That's me. So I thought this was a good, a good slide to start with. Um, Drupal is a very complex uh, CMS and kind of dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, if you got it and you're not really sure what Drupal's all about, um, you can definitely uh, shoot yourself in the foot. The first section I'm going to talk about is uh, some general and Dru Drupal-specific uh, worst practices in kind of your DevOps and your processes. So some of this stuff might sound super obvious, but it's also super important. And I've seen it happen time and time again, where people forget certain things that seem like, well, of course, you're going to have backups. Well, it's happened to me. Uh, I have the kristen.org domain name, and I thought it would be an interesting learning experience to have a junior developer take that domain and the, the site and, and move it from Linode to Pantheon is just sort of a learning exercise. Well, uh, he contacted me and said, um, do you have a copy of that co uh, the code? And I'm like, why? Oh, because I accidentally deleted it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I haven't touched that site in like five years. It, you know, it was just sort of, it's been there forever. I wasn't really paying attention. And you know, fortunately, I had a copy of the code you know, just lying around on my computer. So it was fine, but it was like, oh, shoot, that was probably not the best idea. Um, so there, you know, when you're doing backups, make sure you have a copy of the code, ideally in a repository like Git. Um, you have a copy of your files, and you have a copy of your database. So that's the, the magic three for Drupal. So, this also illustrates a little bit more problem with that uh, website. Now, I wasn't really developing it on it anymore, so it wasn't that big a deal, but there wasn't really a development workflow. He was just taking stuff from live and trying to plunk it over somewhere else. There was no Git repository. There were no backups. So it kind of illustrates a number of problems. Uh, when I talk about development workflow, what I'm talking about is you don't change stuff on live. Right? If you've got code, your, you know, your database and stuff, you don't just start you know, manipulating things on live. You're going to want to have some sort of development workflow. Um, I've inherited sites where there's no Git, there's no dev site, there, you know, just the people are just doing stuff on live, and that's very dangerous. So you're going to want, at minimum, do your development on local, have at least a development site that the client or whoever needs to see it can see, when you push up that code from your local. And then after that, then you can push it onto live. Now, if you have to roll your own, if you're on you know, some sort of system like Black Mesh or Linode or something like that, then you know, sometimes you're going to have to roll your own. But there are other hosted solutions like Pantheon and Acquia and uh, you know, Platform SH and things like that where you can use those tools to have a good workflow. Uh, another problem I see is you don't, you know, you get this site and there happens to be hundreds and hundreds of errors. No one's been paying attention. Like they've been going on for months and months and months. There's just errors going on. So having some sort of monitoring of your errors on a regular basis is super important. Uh, something that I like is to use uh, logging and alerts. And what it will do is actually email me the errors. And believe me, that gets really irritating, and you'll really want to fix them super fast. Um, fortunately, I have other people on my team that I have it emailed them now, and I am filtering them and not looking at them, at them anymore. But someone needs to be looking at those errors every single day and trying to deal with them as fast as possible. 
Likewise, you know, having something like Pingdom, or, um, something like New Relic in order to check your, your speed and your uptime is super important. Uh, another common thing that we see is you, you know, get a new project, you inherit in site, and then, wow, there are 80 modules that have not been updated, like, in forever. And this is a bad thing, uh, not only for security reasons, because there's probably some security updates that need to happen if there's that many, but just bug fixes in general, you know, keeping your site healthy. And once you have that many, it just becomes a very daunting task to try to keep update, you know, to update all of these in one go. Because usually if you're going to try to update 80 at one time, it's probably not going to work. Uh, so doing them in a, a more slow cadence of like, okay, maybe I'm updating, you know, two modules a week or depending on the size of your site, but just having some sort of, you know, cadence so that you're always keeping your stuff up to date. So this is something that I've done on occasion. Um, I, you know, it, it's an easy one to forget. If you do have your development workflow and you're pushing your stuff up to development and maybe you have a test site or staging and then you push up to live, you always, if you're using the features modules, this is, tends to be more relevant in Drupal 7 or before. Uh, some people are using features in Drupal 8, but it's, it's not as needed with all the configuration management available. But reverting your features on live and running up updb if you're using drush or going you know in the url and running the update php so it's very common for someone to forget that step and all of a sudden they have new modules on their site that have been updated but maybe there was some database changes that were associated with that update and they haven't run the update script in order to make those things happen and things can get kind of wonky now if you check your logs you might see some of those problems uh, another thing, if you are using the features module for Drupal 7, or I mean, this would apply to 8 as well, but a pretty common thing is if the developer goes on to live and makes some change to a content type, which you shouldn't be doing on live, um, or a view or something like that, and that information is in features, so saved in a module, then all of a sudden you, your live site says that your features are overridden. And this is a, you know, kind of a common thing. Maybe there's like some emergency and you have to fix something quick and you're like, oh, well, I have to do it on live because, you know, I just have to do it right this second, but I'll get it into features later. You just have to make sure if for some reason you end up doing that, you have to do the same change on your local and then push it through your development workflow so that when you push that out, all of a sudden everything is back um, and not overridden and back on track. So these are just some of the things that you can do wrong when you're doing sort of your development processes and workflow. So we'll talk a little bit about documentation. No one likes to do documentation. Um, so one of my pet peeves is I download a contrib module from Drupal.org and there's no readme file. And I'm sure everyone's done this, right? I immediately go and look for a readme file because I want to know, well, I, you know, I usually probably know what the module's supposed to do, but I might not know, like, what are the configuration steps or, where, you know, a little bit more about the, the project. So um, you can do this with your own custom code as well. If you have custom modules, you can create readme files for each of those. And that way, people will know what it's supposed to do and what configuration is needed or any kind of dependencies on other things, other modules and that sort of thing. Um, we actually have a, a project that we're doing for my company, Hook42, where we actually, as part of our community um, contribution, is we find modules that don't have readme files, and we create a patch with a readme file that has instructions on how to configure the module, and then we upload as a patch and try to get those accepted in the community. So, you know, that's a great way to be able to contribute to the community with really, I mean, you just need to know how to to use the module, and it's pretty simple to do. So similarly, you know, getting code, especially if someone else's code, even your own code, right? I mean, we've all gone 
back later and looked at our code and was like, what was I trying to do there? Why do I have this weird special case? Do I really need that? I don't know, I don't understand. So for your future self, really awesome to write some comments. I'm in the mind of writing too many comments. I've had comments that are like this long for some complex code and that's okay, right? Because as long as the comments are clear, then that's, that's gonna help somebody, either you or someone else that inherits the code. Uh, this is a very, very common issue, uh, patch information. So you can patch, you know, contrib modules, you can patch core. Uh, you know, wouldn't normally patch your own custom code because it's your own custom code, right? You would just make the changes. But anytime you're doing patches for core or contrib modules, you really need to track that information. And there's so many different ways you can track it, but the most important thing is that you're tracking it. So the way we usually do it is we'll have a, a directory, which is called patches, and we'll put, actually I, I like to have the physical patches myself, um, it's just a thing. Uh, some people won't, they'll just link off to the issue queue and that kind of thing. But if you have a custom patch, then you'll need to keep track of the patch. So you can have a directory and then a readme file that says, okay, I did this patch on this date and this is why, and uh, you know, link off to the issue queue if that's, you know, if, if that's relevant. So this is super important in something that I see a lot that people don't do. If you don't keep track of those and you update your contrib module, you update core and you have three patches and you forgot all about them, boom, you're back to not having that code patched and you can have problems. Um, just in general, it's sort of obvious, you know, if you name things weird or inconsistent and people aren't gonna necessarily know, you know, what you're talking about or you might not remember what you're talking about later. So good naming conventions is obviously um, important. This is one from the, from the themers is having a style guide. And, you know, it's very common to have a project and there's no style guide. And the style guide is useful if you want to show whoever owns the site or whoever's involved in making the site, you know, the designer or that, you know, people involved in the design process, what are the things that are possible now with the theme? Like, oh, I can choose from this style or this style or this style, and it helps you make things a lot more consistent. And this has been a big gap. You'll get a lot more kind of one-off things, like, oh, can you just do this one? It's sort of like this, but something else. Whereas if they're actually choosing from an existing style guide, it's much better. This is sort of documentation, but just Drupal coding standards in general. The closer that you get to Drupal coding standards when you're doing your code, it'll be easier for other people to consume that information and understand what you're trying to do. I know for me, if I see a lot of weird formatting, like I can't even read the code, right? I'm just distracted by all the formatting. So this is something to help for other developers to be able to read things properly. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about giving too much control to people. PHP filter, don't use it. So I've, you've probably heard this before in terms of you know, security talk or whatever, best practices. Um, time and time again, I see it enabled, I see it being used. People are adding PHP to views or adding PHP to you know, blocks or whatever, just don't, don't use it. Um, oop, I skipped. Um, I put them out of order. So another one is uh, I had this one project where they were using a JavaScript injector, and the marketing team was just putting whatever JavaScript they wanted just in right in there. Like, oh, that's it. That looks fun. Let's just bad idea. Very very bad idea. Uh, you can use something like Google Tag Manager if you want to let your marketing team use something that's got a little bit more control for them, but is a little bit saner in terms of adding things that are kind of vetted and shouldn't hopefully tank the site. Uh, so along those lines, just permissive text filters in general, you know, just letting your editors do whatever they want in the text editor, oh yeah, I'll just do unfiltered HTML and just ha go to town, which kind of goes to the next one. Like, don't just let them put whatever they want inside of the body field or any text field, right? Just going to town and putting everything in there. Or even if you don't let them do the HTML, you know, I've seen the kitchen sink WYSIWYG. 
right? There's like 50 million buttons there. Why do they need all that? For one, it's confusing, but also it's gonna add all sorts of things to your market that, I mean, really, do you really need that? So, you know, try to figure out what they really, really need, talk to them, try to limit them down to just kind of the basics. And this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Do not give them, you know, if you have content editors on your site, if clients on your site, unless they happen to be Drupal developers, which happens sometimes, I have worked with other teams where like the, the business owner was a Drupal developer. That is rare, that is the exception. But if otherwise, do not give them admin access. I've seen this so many times where you know, like, why are you logging in? You, ha you can change views. Do you know anything about views? No, I don't know. You know, like, what, what are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. You're just, like, giving them the, you know, um, giving them gun, say, shoot yourself, giving them the lightsaber and, you know, cutting themselves up. Um, likewise, for user one, I know all of, you know, the developers here, I'm sure you've logged in as user one, right? It's so easy. You can dress you all up, you all I, and just be like, I'm user one. Oh, I can do anything. You know, try not to do that. Um, just because that way, if you have your own account and everyone on the team has their own account and there's logging, you can see, oh, so-and-so did X. Awesome. I know I can go talk to so-and-so. If user one did X, you know, was it Joe, or Sarah? I don't know. Like somebody logged in and did something. They shouldn't have been doing it. So please, please, if you, don't, if you take one thing away from this stuff, do not let, you know, People that shouldn't be admins be admins and don't use user one. All right, so kind of a big last bucket I'm gonna talk about is having too many things. That's a technical term. Um, so one of the things might be uh, display, you know, just having too many architecture things kind of all, yeah, I'm gonna try that one and try that one and try that one and put them all together and just like, well, I'll lay out, well, I could lay out this one this way and this one that way. So a common one is like, oh, display suite with panels and context. Sure, I'll just use all the things, right? And I'll throw the core blocks in there as well. Um, so think about your architecture, try to minimize, try to standardize and don't go too crazy. Another thing is having too many fields. So, you know, try to think, Having more fields is a performance problem. You know, I've had sites that's got like hundreds and hundreds of fields. And sometimes, you know, most of them are legitimate. But, oh, well, why are there five image fields when really they're all pretty much the same thing? Okay, then have one and, and reuse that. Uh, this is a pretty common one is having too many files at kind of one level, right? So they might just dump them all at the top level. Or they might have, you know, a folder and it's got like thousands and thousands and thousands of files. So you want to have enough folder structures that you can, you know, have a little more sane number of files. You don't want to have one file per directory, but you also don't want to have many thousands. And when you have files or your backups or things like that, these really big things, do not check them into your repository. Do, you know, you know, Git is great for code and, and keeping track of that, but you don't, do not want to be putting in stuff that's really meant for users to dynamically generate. And just in general, I've seen projects where there's just a gazillion views and you're not even sure which is which and why. Why are these like five things kind of the same? You know, there's ways of consolidating and you know, adding contextual filters or making a different display for certain cases, using view modes, you know, you can try to not just, you know, copy another one, copy another one, copy another one and, and do another thing, you know, try to think of um, how you can consolidate. And my favorite one here is installing all the modules, right? You get a project and you're like, there are 300 modules on this site. You gotta be kidding me. And I've had that project. I've had more than one of those projects. Like, why did they install everything? And there's stuff that was prob there's stuff that's probably not used. And if there's no documentation and there's all this stuff and you don't know, you're like, you gotta be kidding me. Why did you do that? So that's just, that's sad. Like, just don't do that. If you wanna test stuff out, test it out on your local, try it out, decide if you like it or not. You know, if you like it, great, you know, 
push it through the process. If you decide later you don't really like it, you need to disable it, uninstall it. Very important, uninstall. That's another thing, don't forget to do that. And then until you've done that uninstall process, don't delete it from your code base because if you don't uninstall and you delete it from your code base, then all of a sudden there's nothing to uninstall, but the, all the data is still there and the variables and all that kind of stuff. So that's a bad one. All right, so those are the kind of big four buckets that I, I have here. But there's one more thing that I want to talk about, which is something called Hacking Core. And um, I, I researched this, like, why do they call it? They say if you hack core, then you kill a kitten. And I don't, I was like, who started that? I don't know, does anyone know who started that phrase? Because I was trying to find the origina originator of that phrase. And I don't know if this is just a Drupal thing or if other communities use this, but it's so sad. But I thought that was like the perfect image. It's like, oh, of course that kitten's just gonna eat that stormtrooper, so it's okay. But, um, so you don't want a hat core. And I've seen it. You, you know, get a site from someone and they've hacked core, they didn't document it, they hacked contrib, and you're like, I have no idea. And I have a confession, I have hacked core. I started Drupal in 2004. Okay, that's a long time ago. I started with Drupal 4.6, I think. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, so I wanted to change some stuff, so we'll, well, I just changed the code, right? I mean, that's just how it works. So, but I learned, and after that project, I, I learned that was, that was a big no-no, I'm not supposed to do that, so I stopped doing it. But um, you can patch core, even a custom patch, as long as you document it, you can patch contrib. If it's something that you think the greater community is, is gonna want, then you should go through drupal.org and upload the patch and document it. But there are occasions actually where you're like, I just wanna add some logging, I'm getting this weird behavior, I have no idea what's going on, no one wants this, inform you know, wants this patch, but I still patch it, I keep track of it, I put it in my patches readme file, and then I know, okay, I made a change, you know, it's just, maybe it's a temporary thing, I'm just gonna have it for a while to gather some information, and then, you know, I'll go from there. So, that's super important. No hacking. No, nope. gotta save those kittens. All right, and we've all been there. Uh, who's here, who here is, is kind of new to Drupal? Show of hands, oh, all right, welcome. Um, so, you know, when you're new to Drupal, you're gonna do things wrong. And even if you're not new to Drupal, you're gonna do things wrong, right? So. Um, you know, if you know, don't know Drupal or kind of how this whole thing works, you're gonna make mistakes, just the way it happens, you know? Uh, and that's why you're here, right? To learn, <laughs> learn what's going on. So, you know, just keep calm, use the Drupal force, use the community, come to these, you know, presentations and read the blog posts and just try to keep up with what's going on because things change all the time. And at that note, I'll open it up for just a couple questions if anyone has anything. There's a mic there. And I went really fast. There. Yeah, there's a, there's a mic, so, because it's being recorded. Or I can relay it. Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. So if you if you're looking for some contrib module and there are ten of them that seem to do the same thing and you're like I don't know which one. So some of the things I look for I look how long the module's been around. I look at when it was last updated. So I look at the development. You know when it was last developed. So there's usually a you know dev version. Like when was that last updated? Also, if there's a, you know, official release, so when was that less updated? Sometimes the dev versus official release, there could be a gap there. Doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. You still might want to use it. You might want to use the dev version, um, you know, with caution. But um, the other thing I look at is the issue queue. Are there a gazillion issues? 
is the maintainer like just out to, you know, they've just left and they're not really paying attention. So those are some of the things that you should look at. Um, and then just Googling and seeing, you know, are, are people talking more about certain things? One other thing is you can see the usage of modules. So there's at the bottom, you know, click on usage and get an idea of where it ranks kind of in the grand scheme of all the different modules. Sure. Um, what exactly do you consider core and what is the difference between um, hacking and um, tweaking? <laughs> tweaking, yeah. Um, Okay, so core is when you go to Drupal.org and you go to project slash Drupal and you download that, right? That's core. Then all the other projects are all the contrib modules that you can tack on and augment core. It's pretty standard. I mean, there's no project where you're only going to have core. You're going to have core plus some number of contributed modules. The number is going to be... be is going to vary, hopefully not 300, but it's not uncommon to have 100 contrib modules on a D7 site. On D8, I've noticed that that number is going down a bit because there's a lot more built into core. Um, as far as you know, what types of things you might uh, tweak in core, um, if, it, if it's anything that's really like f new functionality, then you should be going either writing a custom module and using either plugins or the hook system and augmenting it that way, rather than going in and, and tweaking core. The only time I would recommend possibly doing a custom core tweak or patch is really, it's like logging or something really super benign. Like, you're just trying to collect information. Um, it's so rare that your use case has it where you need to tweak core and it's not something that the greater community would want. Mm -hmm. um, if, it, if you need that much functionality, you should have a custom module doing it. You shouldn't be messing around with the core code. Okay, well then, to uh, quote Emily Latella, never mind. Sorry? <laughs> never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, I had a question about, um, you had mentioned uh, uh, JavaScript injection, and um, I've read documentation on Drupal and how to um, set up jQuery um, using the, the, the themes.info. Um, so my question to you is, uh, what do you mean by JavaScript injection? Uh, there, there's actually a module you can have, which of course there's a module for everything. So there's a module called JavaScript J, you know, JS injector. And it'll just let, you know, whoever's got permission to go and do stuff, just put whatever JavaScript they want in there. So I don't recommend that. Okay, that's, yeah. that's a bad thing. And I've seen it happen. So I think the, the next speaker should be coming up and start plugging in. Um, if anyone has any more questions, I'll be around the rest of the DrupalCon. So feel free to come up and, and uh, ping me. <laughs>